Hello, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year. Welcome back to another Petexia IP Matters uh, webinar. We're going to continue our sessions on PTAP. Uh, as you know, um, patent litigation has been at all-time high, and uh, uh, last year we had over 6,300 uh, cases filed. And Patent Office launched PTAP back in 2012. Uh, to deal with, what, with some of the low-quality patents um, out there. So IPR, in particular, was very popular, has become very popular. And uh, last year, we had, again, over 1,600 um, cases filed. Uh, some companies, obviously, were very active. Among them, you can see the top 10 uh, here. Uh, Apple filed 93 IPRs last year. So. Today, we have invited uh, Dr. Deborah Sterling. Uh, she is joining us from Washington, D.C., from Stern Kessler. And uh, she's going to talk about uh, patent office litigation and some of the lessons learned uh, from practicing at PTAP. Uh, Dr. Sterling, has, uh, uh, his ba her background is biotechnology and pharmaceutical, and uh, she's been um, working on all aspects of IP and including patent enforcement. Uh, she's had over the past few years over 35 uh, cases, uh, IPR cases. Um, so she's also one of the contributing authors to a, a book on patent office litigation. So without further ado, I would like to uh, invite her to join us. Just a quick note that if you have any question throughout the uh, her presentation, please send it uh, through Twitter. Use the hashtag uh, IP Matters. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sterling, please go ahead. OK. Um, is the camera on me? I just wanted to check. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, my name is Deborah Sterling. Um, as I was just introduced, I'm an attorney in Washington, DC. I've been working in um, biotech and pharma patent law for um, for a while now, almost uh, 13 years. Um, um, my background was in interferences and AND work, and that progressed into re-exams and then naturally into IPRs in front of the PTAB. Um, and today, Patexia have asked me to come and talk about PTAB litigation. And it, it can be hard to pick a topic on that because there is so much going on in PTAB litigation and so much that people want to know about. So I picked the topic of the lessons learned, and we have several lessons that we've learned from the last three years. Um, I'm going to focus on just a few today because we have 60 minutes. Um, there are many presentations we could give on this, um, but let's get started. If you don't mind putting the slides up for me. You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so really, um, if we're on, are we on the first slide? Let me go to the next slide, please. Yeah, we're on the next slide. Thank you. Um, so really, we're going to run through what we've learned from the board about some of the ways a petitioner has really tripped at the starting line. And we can see these listed here under where the petition is filed and the patent owner preliminary response on this timeline. This is the timeline that we took from the trial guideline. Um, it shows from the petition is filed, it's roughly about six months until the decision on the petition. And the patent office has been sticking to that six-month um, deadline. And then from there, it's 12 months until the final written decision. That's a statutory timeline. What we're finding is the board is compressing the briefing schedule um, so that it can give itself enough time after the oral hearing to write the final written decisions. And the board, it's coming close to 364 days from institution, but you know the board has never yet gone outside of the one-year bar. But where we're going to be mostly focusing today is, is right at the start of this proceeding. As a petitioner, what can you do to burn your patent office litigation at the starting line? What is it that is something? These are issues that don't go to the merits, so we're not dealing with an argument as to whether something is novel or not obvious. And um, these are sort of real issues that go to procedural, um, and that have a procedural effect in the case and that can really destroy a case for a petitioner. So patent owners out there, these are issues that you want to be looking for 
and making sure if you can attack them that you do and that would give you a better chance of not having the trial instituted in the first place. So we'll see, we'll go through the statutory filing bar, which on its face looks pretty clear, but it's still tripping some people up. The real party in interest is another issue. This must be listed in the petition, and if incorrect, can in some cases have a devastating effect on a trial. 325D discretion, that's the discretion given to the board as to whether to institute a trial, and, and they're using that discretion in a lot of different areas, um, and we'll discuss that. A similar discretion that the board has is whether to join cases, um, so we'll go through a discussion on joinder, and how that can sometimes salvage um, someone who has a statutory filing bar um, on their plate. Um, we'll talk about some high priority challenges and um, prima facie attacks, how they've gone right or wrong for some petitioners. And then once institution has happened, how is that affecting district court litigation? Um, people are curious to hear about stays in district court and whether it's different between PTAB litigation from what we saw in uh, uh, inter-parties re-exams. Um, we're going to touch on a few issues that happen towards the end of the trial, a motion to exclude. Um, that's really where you can trip yourself up at the start, but you don't notice that until you're about to cross the finish line. Um, so we'll discuss that. And then another hot topic, I believe, is estoppel. Um, people have always been curious how the estoppel from the PTAB litigation is going to play out both in front of the patent office and in district court. And we'll get some guidance from what the Fed Circuit has told us so far um, on appeals that have been heard um, in front of them. So that's an overview of today. Let's start with some statistics. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, good. So um, how does it break out? Really, you've just seen some numbers um, from Patexia yourself. We see that patent office litigation is on the rise. In 2015, we were averaging about um, 150 petitions per month, and that was slightly up over 2014. But in total, between um, IPR, CBM, and PGRs, we're looking at about 4,000 petitions since 2012. I think this is much more than the Patent Office um, envisioned um, when it first introduced IPRs, and I think it's certainly taken the industry um, unawares. Um, a lot of people were prepared for these. Some were not, but you can see they are being used. Um, next slide, please. What we see that sort of goes opposite to the filing rate is the institution rate. So our next slide, please. Okay, well, I'll just talk about it while we're waiting for the slide. Um, Actually, the slide is on. Oh, it's on? Oh, okay, I can't yeah. see it. Um, what we've seen is trials being instituted in almost 2,000 IPR proceedings, that's roughly about 72%, and denied in about 27%, close to 30%. And we're seeing a similar institution and denial rate for CBMs. Um, PGRs, it's, it's very early to tell. We've only had a few PGRs filed and a couple instituted. And really, we're seeing that across tech sections, too. Um, the, the tech industry has a slightly higher institution rate than the pharma industry. The pharma industry is saying it's only by a few percent, um, a slightly lower institution rate and um, a slightly lower um, final written decision rate to cancel and claims. And we can see the institution rate's been steadily dropping um, over time, um, starting out around 90% and recently dropping out you know, on a quarterly basis down to about 62%. But cumulatively, depending on how you're tracking your statistics, we're still looking at around 72% institution rate. So then the trial outcomes, what are we looking at? Oh, I think you might be a slide ahead of me. I'm on slide five. Okay. Okay. So how are we seeing the trial outcomes um, working? Um, now this is outcomes for those that have been filed more than 18 months ago and can reach, have had an opportunity to reach a final decision. So out of those, about half have actually reached a final decision, and the other half have been disposed of in different ways. Um, for about 20%, institution was denied, um, and we had about 30% settling um, out, um, mostly post-institution, but about 10% were being settled prior to institution. And this is important because as a petitioner, you know, positioning yourself for settlement, um, this is one good way of doing it. 
And I know there's going to be a seminar on that in a few weeks, so I'm not going to go into details. But we have found, and um, even personally, we find this to be good settlement leverage um, for a person, for a, an entity that's been accused of infringement. In a few cases, uh, parties have requested adverse judgment or abandoned the petition or, or cancelled all their claims. Um, but typically, we're seeing denial, institution, or final written decision of the outcomes, typical outcomes. So then, what we're interested today really is not the outcomes, but more um, what can trip you up filing your petition. Um, so first off, what's one of the first things that can stop a petition in its track? Um, if we go to the next slide, please. There's statutory filing bars. The first of these is the 315A bar for a petitioner who has filed a civil action challenging validity of a patent and then later challenges that patent in an IPR petition. So the point here is um, the board was attempting to try and stop forum shopping. And the statute's pretty clear in its face. If you first file a DJ action, then you're in district court land. Um, but there's some minutia to this issue, um, and the board has dealt with that in a few cases that we'll touch on. And the first one being Ariosa. Um, in Ariosa, the patent owner had contended that the IPR petition was statutorily barred because it was filed after the petitioner had filed a civil action for DJ of non-infringement of a patent. But then the patent owner or the petitioner had raised an invalidity as an affirmative defense. And the PTAB rejected this argument and said that it's pretty clear the statute um, is filing a, a civil action challenging the validity um, of the claim. They looked to the civil rules procedure, federal civil rules procedure, and um, Supreme Court precedent, as well as the legislative history of the AIA to come to this conclusion that it is really only the challenge that's first filed. Affirmative defenses don't count as a bar um, under this, under 315A. So then the message here is, it really, if you're threatened with a, an infringement suit, you don't have to necessarily choose between district court and the PTAB. You could have it both ways, arguably. If you can file a DJ of non-infringement, you can be in district court land and also then be able to file an IPR at the same time. So in Inova, the second case, um, in that case, the petitioner had filed three civil actions challenging the validity of a patent and then later challenged the patent in an IPR petition. And the patent owner raised the statutory bar again and said, no, the petitioner's barred here. But the petitioner argued no bar because um, they had filed but never served the D-Day actions. And the statute says it's um, filed, not served. So the, P the PTAB agreed, noting that you know filed is in the statute, not served. So in this case, file doesn't mean filed and served. It just means filed. Keep that in mind as well. And then lastly, even those that have filed a civil action um, alleging invalidity may not be barred from an IPR. Um, in Butamax, petitioner filed a civil action um, challenging validity of the same patent that they later challenged in an IPR. And on the same day um, that Butamax filed its DJ action, the patent owner had served a complaint of infringement. Um, Butamax voluntarily dismissed without prejudice the DJ action, and that's important. And the patent owner voluntarily dismissed the infringement action with prejudice. Now that distinction of without and with prejudice is important. So in this case, since the infringement complaint was um, served less than a year before the filing date of the petition, that wasn't an issue here, but we'll talk about that in a second. But because Butamax voluntarily dismissed its civil action, the PTAB treated that action as if it never existed, relying on federal circuit precedent. So it basically mooted the, the bar because it was as if the case never existed. So I guess the lesson here is, is, is if you've already filed a DJ action for non-infringement, you may not necessarily be barred from filing an IPR. And if you voluntarily dismiss the civil action without prejudice, you can go in front of the patent office. Now that being said, if your DJ action has a concurrent um, suit filed against you um, from the patent owner, then you need to be um, wary of this one-year statutory bar. And um, we'll get to that next. That's in the next slide, please. So 315B tells us that you cannot file an inter-parties review um, if the petition is filed 
more than one year after the date on which the petitioner has been served with a complaint alleging infringement of the patent. Now, the statutory language doesn't refer to a civil action specifically, but that's really how the board has interpreted this section, and they've made it clear that an ITC action that doesn't um, qualify as a complaint alleging infringement of patent, and nor does a complaint in an arbitration. We really are looking at complaints filed in district court here. So if we go to the next slide, please, we can talk through some of the decisions that the board has given on this issue. Um, the first one here in bio delivery services, um, this addresses the issue of whether the timing requirement for 315B is modified by the issuance of a re-exam certificate. So as we just heard, 315B bars an IPR if the petition is filed at least one year after service of an infringement complaint. Um, and in this case, the petitioner was served with a complaint more than one year before they filed the IPR petition. But after the complaint was served, and before the petition was filed, the patent had been subject to a re-examination. So the petitioner contended that because the re-examination may result in a change of claim scope from the claims that were asserted um, in the, the, the litigation, um, that the one-year bar shouldn't apply. And the PTAB disagreed. Now, the reasoning being that a re-examination certificate doesn't result in a new patent issuance. Um, so that means that the, the, the timing requirement still runs. So if you have an IPR directed to amended complaint or claims in a re-exam patent, and the original patent was the subject of an infringement complaint, um, the one-year bar is running from service of that complaint. So keep that in mind um, when you're trying to time the filing of your IPR petition. So if you contrast that with a reissue proceeding, um, I'm not aware of a case on point yet. Um, it may be out there, but I'm not aware of it. But um, the AIA considers reissuance of a patent to be just that, reissuance of a patent, and indeed it can restart the nine-month clock on a PGR window. So one thing to consider is would a reissue be treated differently than a re-exam in this case and restart the time bar or, or get rid of the time bar of a complaint filed earlier on a patent that was later put into reissue. Um, that's something we'll have to wait and see um, how that goes. So Apple teaches us that you have to look at the earliest filed complaint. It's not just any complaint filed on the patent, it's the earliest one. In this case, the patent owner asserted the patents at issue in the IPR in 2010 and then again in 2012. And the PTAB just took a strict reading of the statute and said it's the earlier one that counts. That complaint was filed and served and therefore you're outside the one year bar. Um, now interestingly in this case, um, the board allowed Apple to move for Joinder with another IPR. And we'll discuss Joinder in a minute, but um, Joinder kind of gives you an out from this one-year bar. And that's essentially what the board did here. They, they let Apple join another proceeding. So, and again, for the one-year bar, much like we just discussed, if you dismiss a DJ action um, without prejudice, you can remove the, the civil action bar. Similarly, if an infringement complaint that was served more than one year earlier but has since been voluntarily dismissed, that will remove the one year statutory bar too. And that would open it um, up for, um, for IPR. Um, conversely, if it's dismissed with prejudice, the case is dismissed with prejudice, that doesn't remove the bar. And we've seen that in some cases in front of the PTAB. Um, indeed, LG Electronics is one case that deals with that. And that's one of the, I think there's three cases that the PTAB has deemed uh, precedential for the IPR and CBM proceedings, and that's one of those precedential cases. So it makes clear that if the infringement suit is dismissed with prejudice, then the trigger, the bar is still there. So you really need to be aware of your concurrent proceedings um, involving the challenged patent, and you have to act appropriately prior to your stat bar um, to make sure that you're getting your um, petition on file. Um, and then you also have to consider your forum. Are you really in the best forum if you filed a DJ for invalidity? Or, and it's, you know, should you consider changing? Or should you try both forums and go with a DJ for non-infringement and still leave the patent bar or the patent office open as a forum for a challenge? So where else can a petitioner get burned? Um, if we go to the next slide. Real party and interest has become an issue. It's becoming more and more popular as a challenge um, because the you're required as a petitioner to list in the petition 
the real party in interest. Um, and why that's important is, you know, for um, I guess for estoppel purposes, you want to know who's involved, but also you know for conflicts between judges and that. But really, everyone should know who they're facing on the other side of the V. Um, who is a real party in interest? Um, might have the statute now. The patent office rules really define it. Um, the trial practice guide gives some basic insight, and generally, it's the party that desires review of the patent. So it's anyone at whose behest the petition has been filed. And that breaks down really to controlling who controls the proceeding. Um, if we go to the next slide, the board has elaborated um, on real party and interest a little bit. It's a very fact specific analysis and typically goes to financial control. Um, limits on whether to consider a non party as a real party and interest, they've risen in cases involving co defendants or related corporate entities. Now, the PTAB is found entities listed in a certificate of interested entities in an unrelated district court proceeding to not be real parties in interest. And similarly, co defendants in litigation without more, that's not a real party in interest. A contractual agreement um, that doesn't give a co defendant a right to intervene or control the petitioner's defense doesn't give rise to a real party in interest. And similarly, indemnification clauses in purchase agreements. Between a petitioner and a non-named entity does not make them uh, a real they unnamed entity a real party in interest without more. For related corporations, um, it's not really whether the unnamed entity controls the listed entity, but whether they control the post-grant proceeding. Um, and where the corporate relationship has been really blurred to the point it's not able, you know, the board can't determine where one entity ends and the other one starts, that's more likely. Um, where the patent office is finding a real party in interest, especially if the unnamed entity has or could have exercised control over the petition. So those are things to think about um, when you're looking at real party in interest. Um, talk with your client, find out the different corporate entities, find out different relationships, and consider them in view of the, the very fact-specific findings that the board has done on this issue. Because um, it matters. Um, really, um, why does it matter? Um, the, it can really trip you up. The, the, the petition has to list it, um, as I've just said, and if you don't list it, you can lose your filing date. Now, in some cases, that's important, and in some cases, it doesn't. So the board can allow you to correct your petition to add your unlisted party, and in some cases, as I just said, you know, people lose their filing date. Um, in one case, in, in Valio, or Valio, they had a near miss on this issue. Um, in that case, it was one day before the statutory bar date, and um, a number of entities filed four IPR petitions against patents owned by Magna. They identified a number of real parties of interest, including Valio Inc., but Valio Inc. had actually ceased to exist as a corporate entity about seven months before the petition was filed. And, um, Velio Inc.'s successor in interest was named Velio North America Inc., and it wasn't named as a real party in interest in the petition. Magna raised the issue with the board, and the board authorized briefing on the issue, and the petitioners filed updated mandatory notices to correct the identification of the real parties in interest. And according to the brief, they didn't learn of the name change until recently, and then promptly updated their mandatory notices. And in this case, it seemed to be just because of a successor in interest and the prompt action of Valio, um, that the, the patent office found this error in identifying real party and interest to be minor and allowed Valio to correct the petition without losing its original filing date. Now, had Valio lost its original filing date, it would have been outside the one-year stat bar and therefore unable to file a petition for IPR. So this really could have killed Valio's um, petition, you know, right at the outset before they started. So you want to be sure of your real party and interest. And we see where it was fatal to Corning. Um, here Corning, in Corning, the board instituted review of three patents. Now the petitions themselves were filed much less than a year after the lawsuit was um, served against the petitioner, so there was no threat at that time of a 315 time bar. But the patent owner did argue that the petition was not entitled to the original filing date for lack of listing all real parties in interest. Um, and then the patent owner argued that there should be a new filing date if that was corrected and set only upon submission of updated mandatory notices. Um, after institution, 
the board authorized motions for additional discovery um, on this issue. And based on the evidence that was brought forward in that additional discovery, the board um, found that there was sufficient commingling between the named and unnamed corning entities, that the unnamed entities were actually real parties in interest and were not listed on the petition. Now here, instead of allowing Corning to update its mandatory notices and accord a new filing date, the board noted that if it did so now, we would be outside that 315 bar date. So instead, the board just terminated the proceeding. So a real party in interest is important, and it behooves the petitioner to properly list the real parties in interest. So as I said, talk with your client, make sure everyone's listed. It may be better to be over-inclusive than under-inclusive in, in this issue. And likewise, as a patent owner, if you're facing a petitioner challenge, look to this issue. And if you're aware of any other real parties in interest that should be listed, um, focus on that issue. And we've seen um, the board authorizing additional discovery into this issue. I mean, and, and as I've seen it um, more frequently than they've um, ordered additional discovery on any other issue. So this is becoming important. And if you can file a request for additional discovery that meets the Garmin factors, you're likely to get additional discovery on the real party and interest. So let's, next slide, please. And that's the 325D discretion. Um, we call it second bites of the apple. Um, really, what happens if you um, fail with your first petition and your trial is not instituted? Um, we know that the estoppel doesn't apply until the final written decision. So it's not like you're estopped. And you can request reconsideration, but we find those to be um, not a fruitful way of moving forward. Um, but how many times can you um, challenge an issued patent in a review proceeding before the patent office? Um, initially, um, People were getting second bites of the apple, sometimes once, sometimes twice, but now we're seeing limits emerging as the PTAB's considering the multiple cases it has, and it's really starting to flex its discretionary authority. So under um, the statute 325D, the PTAB can take into account whether the same or substantially the same prior art or arguments were already presented to the office. Now, the board takes a really, like a case-by-case -case approach here and applying this discretionary authority, and no one factor is dispositive, um, but these are what I've listed here in parsing through the cases are um, typically the categories that um, the board breaks down its uh, 325D discretion into. And these are the things that the board considers. So really whether the previous petition was instituted and remains pending, um, whether the second petition was brought by the same petitioner or a different petitioner, and whether the second petition uses the same or different prior art as the previous petition. Um, whether it's the same claims or different claims, whether there's a one-year bar involved, new declaratory evidence, and also whether you could have sought joinder. These are all issues that the board considers in um, whether determining whether it's going to exercise its 325D discretion and deny institution of trial. In general, they're more likely to invoke 325D against a party that's participated in the earlier proceeding. And it can make little difference if the petitioner's relying on the same art or raising new art. Um, if you're doing the former, relying on the same art, the PTAB faults the petitioner for using the same or substantially the same prior art, really. And if you do the latter and raise new art, the PTAB faults you for not having a good enough reason why you couldn't raise that art in the first petition. So it's basically a lose-lose situation there. And the Patent Office has also exercised its discretion when a second petitioner uses an earlier decision as a roadmap and drafting a second institution worthy petition. You know, in this case, when the first institution is denied and the Patent Office tells the petitioner where they fail to meet their burden, and the board is not happy when someone takes that and, and drafts a second IPR petition. Um, it's in the minority. Some panels have found this approach permissible, but more typically, um, the Patent Office is denying the second bite of the apple. So how do you maximize or minimize the chance of the Patent Office exercising its discretion? Um, really, the simplest way is filing a petition that gets instituted in the first place. Um, but feeling that, if it's the same petitioner filing the second petition, it looks that if the petitioner makes an effort to address the 325D issue, the board is more likely um, to not exercise its discretion. 
So depending on the reasons for denying the first petition, you know, one way might be to explain why your newly presented prior art references were not available when the first petition was filed, or maybe emphasize that the first petition was denied on a procedural issue rather than on the merits, um, or maybe explain why the argument in the second petition, if it relies on the same prior art, why it is nonetheless not substantially the same as the first petition. Um, and if you're the second petitioner and a different party from the first um, petitioner, um, and the first petition is instituted, one strategy is instead of um, filing just your own second petition, file that second petition along with a motion for a joinder, because um, that may be preferable to running the, the risk of the 325D discretion at the board. So that moves us on to the next slide, which is the joinder. And joinder is also discretionary, and basically any, um, I uh, should say patent or petitioner, <laughs> may request joinder via a motion um, no later than one month after the institution date of an IPR for which joinder is requested. So to put that more simply, um, typically this happens by a second petitioner filing a petition for IPR simultaneously with a motion for joinder within one month of a first proceeding being instituted. Now this can be a useful strategy for those um, that are facing that one year time bar that we discussed at the start of the proceeding. Um, and that's because the 315 time bar does not apply um, to joinder. So if a petitioner, um, if you have a competitor or maybe a co-defendant in the same litigation and based on the time of you know, alleging infringement, your co-defendant is time barred for an IP from an IPR but you are not, um, consider if you file an IPR that you may be opening up the IPR again to your co-defendant in the litigation or to another direct competitor who's maybe in the litigation that you're not in. So they'll still have to successfully move to join. Um, typically they'll have to do so within the one month time frame, but they at least get a chance. Um, but what have we learned from the patent office about joinder? Um, well, you can't join if the base proceeding has been terminated, and that just makes sense. There is no proceeding left to join, and that was a pretty straightforward decision. Um, typically, um, and as the rule says, you must file your request for joinder within one month of institution, but in some cases the board has waived that um, and also allowed a party to not um, have to file a motion for joinder simultaneously with the petition. And we saw that, we discussed the Apple case earlier, where Apple was statutorily barred, and instead of just denying the petition or dismissing the proceeding, the board um, allowed Apple to join another existing trial on the same patented issue. And then in Sony, um, that's where um, a trial was instituted in May, and Sony didn't file a petition with a motion for joinder until August. And given that there was several months in between those dates, the patent owner argued that Sony was too late. Um, but what had happened in July, the patent office had instituted a second petition and joined it to that first one that was instituted in May, and Sony's petition was within one month of that decision. So because Sony's petition relied on the same grounds, prior art, and expert declaration as the instituted trial, um, and in that case there were other extenuating circumstances too, but the PTAB allowed joinder in that case, um, even though and the motion was filed outside the one-month period. Uh, there are other cases, though, where the Patent Office has not waived that one-month time period, so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't waste time if you're considering joinder. I think filing within the one-month time period is the best move here. Um, why this is important um, to some parties, especially co-defendants in a litigation, is if you want a seat at a settlement table. Um, the, if an IPR is filed and settled, the second joint party, if the first party drops out, the second joint party can then assume first role and stay involved in the, the IPR, um, but it also, you know, in the first instance, will get you a place at a settlement discussion at least, um, and I'm sure the seminar in a few weeks will go into that in more detail. Um, and lastly, um, we had a, an expanded panel decision they made it clear, this was uh, target maternity, that joinder is for joining parties and not issues. Um, when the proceedings started, you know, there was joinder of issues typically, um, but uh, target maternity 
um, in the expanded panel kind of put a stop to that. But there was a strong dissent in target maternity that went the other way and decided that you know it should be parties and issues, not just parties. Um, but subsequent decisions, including Skyhawks, the one I've listed here, they've made it clear that um, the PTAB is, at least most panels, are following the, the majority decision in, in Target and that Joinder is limited to parties. Okay, so next slide, please. This priority challenges, um, and this is important because um, IPRs are limited to cha challenging novelty and obviousness of patents based on printed publications and prior art. So that's prior art patents, published applications, technical journals and the like, but it must be um, printed publication. So one strategy we've seen petitioners use um, is to challenge the priority date to which a patent is entitled and to effectively claim priority to an earlier non-provisional or provisional or provisional application. The earlier application must both describe and enable the currently claimed invention. Now, typically, a petitioner uses this approach to increase the pool of art that's available. And um, sometimes intervening art can present the strongest basis for challenging patent claims uh, in, a, in an IPR. So we find um, this has been successful um, in a lot of cases. Um, about half cases, the priority challenge has been successful. We've seen um, 63 institution decisions and seven final written decisions on this issue. Um, and typically about half of the time, uh, the petitioner has been successful. Um, and the petitioner was successful not only in getting the institution decision, um, the priority challenge in the institution decision, but maintaining it in the final written decision. Next slide, please. So it, we think that um, PGR, you know, 112 um, is really not an issue in IPRs. Um, and it seems like this kind of attack would be prohibited. Um, but it's actually not. The patent office has let it through. Um, and priority challenges haven't been successful when the 112 first paragraph issue was raised during prosecution and the claims were allowed over it. It's the same issue. Um, but the patent office has allowed it where a similar issue was raised in a, a you know, a related patent um, application but the claims in the issued patent were significantly different. So, um, and the rationale for allowing these priority tax in the continuation scenario really comes from INRI NTP, the Federal Circuit's 2012 decision. Um, and in that case, um, even though you have um, not provisional to non-provisional, but a chain of continuing provisionals, and you can still sever that priority chain if there is lack of a written description or enabling of disclosure in the earlier file continuations. And when you sever a priority chain, typically the, the patent is, the goal is to have the patent at issue um, have only an effective filing date of its own filing date. And as I said, this can really increase the, the wealth of um, prior art available to a challenger. Um, but in one case, um, a priority attack did more than bring an intervening art we go to the next slide, we can see that in one case, um, a priority challenge actually turned a PGR ineligible patent into a PGR eligible patent. So um, by law, post-grant reviews, PGRs, they're limited to patents issuing from applications that have an effective filing date on or after March 16th, 2013. So, and, and in that case, it's the challenge patent contained or contained at any time a claim to an invention that has an effective filing date on or after that. So if your earliest filing date is on or after, PGR is out, you're PGR eligible. But if your earliest filing date is before March 16th, 2013, um, then you're not PGR eligible, ideally. But if you have a string of continuations or provisional to non-provisional that straddles this date, then your priority chain is open to a challenge. Um, now, you know, as sort of towards the end of last year, I think out of 14 petitions, file seven had challenged priority by contesting the earliest effective filing date. And there may be even more now because there's more filings happening every day. But in one recent decision, um, I think in the last week or two, uh, the Patent Office instituted PGR on one of these bridging patents. Um, and in this case, it was the Ingram case. Um, the, 
The priority chain extended back over a decade here of continuations that all had the identical disclosure. So the attack was, so it was really a 112 um, attack in the guise of a priority attack. Um, and the PTAB, the PT, PTAB excuse me, um, so they argued that the effective filing date analysis, um, sorry, the patent owner had argued that the effective filing date analysis was not warranted at the institution stage. Um, but the patent office said, no, it's, we, we should be deciding this now. And because the patent office um, severed priority, this patent became eligible for PTR. And now PTR doesn't just um, open the window for more art, more prior art, it actually opens the window for um, 112, 101, um, all sorts of statutory challenges in addition to the prior art challenge. So as a patent owner, um, be wary of your straddling patents, um, your patents that straddle the state, and as a petitioner, um, consider severing priority um, as a strategy to move a patent from an IPR world into a PGR world. So next slide, please. Another place where we've seen um, petitioners trip up is, is the effective filing date of a 102e document and what makes it qualify as prior art. So um, it's commonly, you know, it's a common belief that for your invalidating prior art reference to be entitled to the filing date of a provisional, the provisional application has to contain the same invalidating disclosure. And about 25 years ago, um, in rebirth time, clarified that the reference patent is only entitled to the benefit of its filing date of a provisional if the provisional application provides support for the claims in the patent. And Dynamic Drinkware is um, a federal circuit case where they really reaffirmed their time and um, confirmed that it's not enough just to have support for the disclosure in the reference patent that you're relying on in the earlier application, but the reference patent, its claims must also be supported. Um, and really, as the Federal Circuit put it, they said a provisional application's effectiveness as prior art depends on its written description support for the claims of the issued patent of which it was provisional. So in Dynamic Drinkware, the, the petitioner didn't compare the claims of the prior art patent to its provisional application. Instead, they just compared the disclosure. Um, so they didn't sufficiently demonstrate that the prior art patent was entitled to its earliest filing date. And the PTAB uh, instituted IPR, but in a final written decision, and determined that the prior art reference was not prior art because it didn't qualify under 102E based on that the, the, basically the petitioner had not met the burden to show it qualified as prior art under 102E. And last week, um, the PTAB issued two decisions on this. Um, the first one follows um, word time and dynamic and um, holds that a patent. Um, it's claiming priority to a um, through 120 and 119E, so both through a non-provisional and a provisional chain um, requires the claims be supported by 112. But in the second decision, the PTAB actually extended um, the word time drink prior rationale to a prior art published application and said that um, akin to, to word time, the if you're using a prior art published application and relying on an earlier disclosure for a 102e date, you must also show that that earlier disclosure can fully support the published application claims. Um, so that reinforces you know, what a petitioner does actually have to show um, to provide sufficient evidence that the prior art they're relying on actually is prior art. And as a patent owner, it's definitely worth um, exploiting any weaknesses in that um, argument because then typically you could remove a prior art reference under 1OE as prior art. Next slide, please. So um, there's one mistake that the petitioner can make in a petition that it may not actually trip them up until the um, finish line. Um, and you make it right at the start in the petition, and it's not until a motion to exclude um, that you really see your error. So as you know, the petition is really the only opportunity that the petitioner has to prove its case, and um, that includes providing all the evidence you need to meet the petitioner's burden. Um, those grant proceedings are subject to the federal rules of evidence. Always bear that in mind. And you can object to either the petitioner's evidence or when the patent owner puts on their case, the petitioner can um, object to that evidence too. Now the patent owner gets an opportunity to object to all the pre-institution evidence um, 
that's really everything prior to institution, within the first 10 days of institution, don't miss that window. Um, if the evidence is flawed, go ahead and attack it. Um, petition will have an opportunity to cure, but if they don't take that opportunity or they don't adequately cure, you can move to exclude this evidence. And that's really what happened in the Magna case. Uh, Magna case here. In that case, the um, patent owner argued that one of the references submitted in the petition was inauthenticated and um, objected to the evidence right after institution, and the evidence was not cured. And there was a lot of briefing on this um, throughout the case. But once the briefing was completed, um, it was in the, the patent owner filed a, a motion to exclude this evidence. And that's important because every ground on which the, the trial was instituted relied on this prior art reference. So the patent office granted the motion to exclude um, if the document was authenticated. And because that document was not available, all of the grounds fell. Um, so the, the final written decision confirmed all the claims. So as a petitioner, make sure you've got your evidence in place. Um, and as a patent owner, um, look at the evidence and see if you can attack it, because it really could kill the IPR. Next slide, please. So um, I believe now we're moving on to lessons learned you know, about the AI. A PTAB proceedings that come from district court as opposed to um, the PTAB itself. So really, number one, you cannot appeal the institution decision. We've seen this um, discussed in several cases. Um, the Federal Circuit has made it clear, even on standing issues, you can't appeal the institution decision. And likewise, district courts um, have weighed in on this too, and it's the same thing. Even standing issues, they're dismissing appeals. And what about stays? Can you go to the stay slide, please? Um, district courts are they're much more inclined to stay cases based on IBRs, IPRs and CBMs than they ever were for the inter-parties re-exams. Um, that's likely because the inter-parties uh, re-exams took so very long to get a resolution and that the district court was you know, going to be much, um, it was going to be finished well before the re-exam was. Um, I mean, personally, I have re-exams that were filed long before IPRs ever came about, and we still haven't even got to the board on those. And conversely, you have IPRs that have already been briefed at the Fed Circuit. So you can see the real difference in timing there. And we're seeing that you know district courts are generally granting stays. Over half um, of stay requests have been granted, typically. But um, the, the courts are waiting until institution. So if the parties file after institution, they're, they're getting a stay. Or if they file pre-institution, sometimes the district court is sort of holding the stay until there's an institution decision. Once it's instituted, then they will they'll, they'll stay the case. So next slide, please. Um, estoppels are a key um, issue. People are interested in estoppels. Mm -hmm. And it's relatively simple when you're considering IPRs, because IPR petitioners, as we discussed, you can only challenge patentability based on prior art printed patents and printed publications. So regardless of your IPR status or your final outcome, plain language doesn't preclude a petitioner from challenging a patent on 101 or 112 in a different um, forum. Um, likewise, you're not stopped from relying on prior art that's not a printed publication. Um, in the Redline case, the PTAP concluded its final written decision in its final written decision that Redline had failed to show that the, the claims were unpatentable in the challenge patent. So in a parallel district court litigation, um, Star moved to strike red lines and validity contentions on the basis of the estoppel from the patent office. But the difference here is the reference that was at issue in district court wasn't actually a printed publication. It was a physical machine. And that's not something that one can put in front of the patent office. So there, um, the district court decided that no estoppel attached because, of course, the, the, the actual machine could not have been raised in the IPR's prior art. Um, but what about cases that have not reached a final decision? Um, some district courts are, are finding an estoppel relying on references used in an ongoing IPR. Um, we have limited data points here, of course, um, because a lot of stays we've just seen um, have been granted. But at least one district court has implied that a petitioner would be estopped from relying, from relying on prior art references used in a concurrent IPR, even though the IPR has not yet reached a final written decision. So that was Invensys. Um, and Invensys said, you know, they, they'll be stopped from, maybe stopped from the 14 prior art references raised before the PTAB, but that court decided that they would, in that case, 
um, the alleged infringer would not be stopped from relying on the roughly 200 references that they raised in the litigation. Um, and of course, when the PTAB denies an IPR petition, you know, the proceeding ends without reaching a final written decision. So the statutory estoppel shouldn't apply. Um, and indeed, um, National Oil Well, in that case, National Oil Well alleged that Omron was stopped from raising certain arguments in district court due to the PTAB's denial of the petition. But the district court disagreed and said, you know, in that case, estoppel has not applied. There's been no final written decision. And then in Dell, um, after a final negative uh, final written decision, the petitioner filed a second IPR asserting that, um, I believe we're on the next slide, sorry, asserting that um, the second proceeding, sorry, asserting that the references used as part of the 103 rejection in the first IPR actually anticipated certain claims. So that the first IPR argued um, obviousness grounds based on a piece of prior art, and then in this, which was um, received a negative final written decision. In the second IPR, the petitioner argued that the same piece of prior art actually anticipated claims. Um, and the PTAP saw this as squarely within the estoppel provision because they decided that the petitioner could have raised this argument in their earlier IPR. Um, so they're squarely estopped. And in SDI, there was an earlier IPR proceeding that found a subset of those claims, um, including independent claims, unpatentable, based on the same prior art that was asserted in the second proceeding. And that second proceeding was directed towards claims that depended from the independent claims but were, that had been found unpatentable in the first proceeding, but those new dependent claims had not been challenged in the first proceeding. Um, the petitioner argued that the patent owner was stopped from arguing any patentability or admissibility issues that was decided in petitioner's favor in the prior proceeding. Excuse me, but the PTAB disagreed, um, and it relied on the discussion accompanying the final rule that the estoppel applies against a party whose claim has been cancelled, not merely held unpatentable. And here, the claims hadn't been cancelled because the appeal window was, was still open, the appeals rights had not been exhausted. So um, to me, that was an interesting take on what the rules actually said, um, on whether the claim needs to be cancelled before the estoppel applies. So then I believe we have some slides on the Federal Circuit. So AA appeals to the Federal Circuit. What are we seeing? Um, there's a 450 plus cases docketed, um, mostly from IPR decisions, but that just goes with the numbers that have been filed. Um, and really we're seeing petitioners are filing, our pat patent owners are filing more frequently than petitioners. Um, and we've seen that the Federal Circuit has docketed 104 appeals in 2014, tripled that in 2015, and already in 2016 it faced 40 um, decisions. The overwhelming take-home message, next slide, please, is that the, the Federal Circuit is affirming the Patent Office, uh, not only on substantive issues, but on procedural issues, too. Very few of these have been reversed or amended. Mostly that's to do with claim construction. Um, it's the broadest reasonable in, um, interpretation of the claims. And um, in cases where the Fed Circuit has felt that the board has been overly broad, they've reversed and remanded the cases. So the next slide um, just really goes through um, you know, a summary of those decisions. And if we go to the last slide, it's just a few cases. Um, I realize we're out of time, which is why I'm sort of rushing this little bit at the end to leave some time for questions. But um, the, very, the last slide prior to the question slide just lists some of the key cases that we've heard from the Federal Circuit. Of course, that could be a presentation all on its own. Um, there's a lot going on at the Federal Circuit, and we're learning a lot from that. Um, so, but if anyone's interested, um, let us know. We're happy to do another presentation. Um, but with that, um, I believe there's been some questions. Thank you very Thank you much, much uh, Deborah. Deborah. So, uh, yeah, there were a few questions. Um, um, the first one is uh, maybe kind of uh, a broader question on pharmaceutical patent, and the question is. Uh, does IPR, uh, basically, do you see any impact on pharmaceutical industry? We've seen some uh, activity, and there has been talks on, uh, you know, some uh, pharmaceutical companies maybe take advantage of uh, extensions, and uh, some of those patents are not high quality. So do you think, like, we will see the same impact? Generally, 
uh, it, uh, pharmaceutical patents are known to be higher quality, but do you see the same impact uh, in terms of claim cancellation on pharmaceutical patents? So what we're to my tech. Sure. Um, so we, we parsed out statistics, and of course it really depends on how you parse out statistics, but we've looked at, you know, Tech Center 1600 is typically where you're going to find the, the pharma and life sciences patents. Um, and in biopharma, typically the institution rate is similar to overall institution rates. Currently we're looking, you know, it's only a couple of percent difference um, between those in biopharma compared to the rate overall. But the real difference we're seeing is in the cancellation um, percentage of asserted claims. Really overall of claims for which trial is instituted. So this isn't claims, you know, that are challenged, but claims for which trial is instituted Overall, about 85% of those instituted claims are cancelled, but in pharma, we're closer to about 60%. So what we're seeing is, while it may be similarly, you know, institution is similar, once we get into it, and um, the pharma cases can be more difficult to cancel claims or easier for a patent owner to maintain claims, and that's typically through um, the declaratory evidence um, that the patent owner gets to put on once the, the trial starts. And it's also due to the technically trained judges. They really do know their stuff and they dig in and, and understand the technology for pharma patents at least. Okay, so it again confirms that generally pharma patents are maybe stronger or higher quality. That's what the statistics seem to say. And I, I'm not sure if it's because of the patents that were specifically challenged or, you know, whether those patents were stronger or whether it is to do more with the, the quality of pharma patents. Okay. One other question, actually, uh, there has been programs, and actually Patexia also offers something similar, Patexia Defend, that it's a membership program and companies join and um, they file, uh, the company that runs that program files IPR. You know, uh, uh, on the real party in interest issue, do you see any um, conflict or impact, like if a um, company joining the program but they're not necessarily controlling. So they fund the program overall but they don't control any uh, particular IPR. Yeah, so that's one that's hard to, 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 you know, just make a call on here on the spot. It really does depend. This is one of the most fact-specific um, investigations that the Patent Office does and they really do weigh um, various issues on this. I mean, typically funding and control are the two things that would determine mostly whether a party is a real party in interest. Now typically just we've seen from parent corporations just funding you know a subsidiary isn't enough without more but it really depends on the level of control um, that the party that's not named either exercised or could have exercised. That's just something to bear in mind. How active are you in the actual proceeding? Do you determine whether it's filed do you determine defenses? Do you determine grounds chosen? Do you decide whether it goes forward or there's settlement? If you start to have input onto those things, you're, you're a real party in interest. You cross that line. But this really is um, a fact-intensive investigation, and I do encourage you to, to do it if you're, you're ever in a situation where you're just not sure. It's better to be safe than sorry. Okay, and uh, one last question on uh, join there. Actually, the question is, uh, you mentioned they have about one month uh, to join. Um, do they have any control, like, because that's after the petition is filed, and can they, for example, control uh, oral hearing, or in, in what capacity can they participate? Okay, so the, the one month um, joinder, it's actually one month from the decision on institution, and to what extent the party controls, the second joining party can control um, the proceeding, well, that, that varies. Um, the board is interested, of course, in the, as they call it, it's the speedy, just, and quick, you know, inexpensive resolution of the trials. Um, the best way to get joined is to use the same grinds, same prior art, same um, declarant as the, the existing proceeding. And, and to, the, to the extent you want to vary from that, or, for example, in some cases, the joining party has requested additional pages, you know, a limited number, they say, when the petitioner files its reply, we would like five pages. When the petitioner dispo you know, deposes a declarant, we'd like a few hours. And, and when asking for that, the board is less inclined to allow joinder. And they're more happy if the joining party is just going to sort of be in the background and go along with the proceeding and not affect the trial schedule. They're on a tight schedule with a lot of proceedings. 
So the less you interrupt that, the, the more likelihood you have of joining. Okay. I guess that's all questions. Uh, once again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sterling. It was a very interesting presentation. And uh, um, I would like to, at the end, uh, just remind everyone that uh, next month we have uh, two webinars, again, continuing our, on our PTAB. There's going to be pros and cons, PTAB versus district court by Matt Phillips and Kevin Lawrence from Renaissance IP. Uh, it's going to be on February 11. And the second one on February 25th is by Manny Schechter, the Chief Patent Counsel of IBM on uh, Alice and Getting Past Alice. Uh, so once again, thank you for joining us today. The presentation and this talk is going to be available online. Um, after this, we will send an email to all the registered uh, members and look forward to seeing you next month for the next webinar. Thank you and have a nice afternoon. Bye. <laughs>